Good evening, everyone. My name is Mandeep uh, Virk, and uh, I want to welcome everyone to the NYU Langone Shoulder and Elbow Surgery webinar. The topic of the webinar today is advances in cuff, rotator cuff tear treatment, updates on failed and irreparable rotator cuff tears. We have an all-star lineup of speakers today. We are joined by Dr. Rokito, who is the Division Chief for Shoulder and Elbow Surgery at NYU, and he's going to talk to us about principles and practice of uh, orthoscopic rotator cuff repair. That talk will be followed by a uh, talk by Dr. Kwan, who's going to talk to us about non-prosthetic options for irreparable massive tears. This will be followed by a talk by Dr. Jaswavi uh, about superior capsular reconstruction. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, Dr. Zuckerman, the chairman, who's going to be talking to us uh, about reverse total shoulder orthoplasty in the setting of irreparable rotator cuff tears. So I'll get started first, and uh, the topic of my talk is rotator cuff repair, factors affecting healing, and updates on recent advances in biologic treatment. My updates are available on the AAOS website, and uh, there is no uh, relevant disclosure with respect to this talk today. Rotator cuff provides uh, dynamic stability and range of motion to the shoulder joint. The insertion of cuff to the bone is called emphasis, and it's structurally composed of a layer of non-calcified and calcified fibrocartilage between the tendon and the bone. Rotator cuff pathology is diverse and presents a spectrum that ranges from tendonitis to a complete tear and cuff tear arthropathy. Rotator cuff disorders present as pain and weakness and constitute considerable health burden to our society. We have made significant progress in the mechanical fixation of rotator cuff tears. Consequently, majority of small to medium-sized rotator cuff tears heal after repair, but the healing rates in large tears are variable. Failed rotator cuff tears are a major source of morbidity and loss of shoulder function. There are multiple reasons for failure of cuff repair, and this usually involves interplay of both mechanical and biological factors. From a mechanical standpoint, failure can occur at tendon suture interface and at the bone anchor interface. Presence of poor quality tissue, tissue gap formation at repair site and repair under high tension can result in failure at tendon suture interface, which is by far the most common site of repair failure. Situations like greater tuberosity fracture, anchor pullout, can result in failure at anchor bone interface. Additionally, pseudoparalysis, proximal migration of humeral head, aggressive rehab and non-compliance all can predispose to mechanical failure of rotator cuff. Majority of rotator cuff repairs involve tendon to bone healing, and poor healing response is a common biologic reason for failure of repair. Presence of fatty atrophy, fatty infiltration, tendon tissue loss, they all indicate a compromised tendon health, which predisposes to poor healing. Certain patient-related risk factors are associated with poor healing response, and they include, for example, age, advancing age, active smoking, which, are, which have been shown in literature to be associated with higher failure rate. Now, there is increased interest in application of biologic strategies for enhancing tendon-to-bone repair. In order to make these strategies work, we need to have better understanding of healing mechanisms and know the key players involved in healing and regeneration of rotator cuff tear. Healing of a rotator cuff, torn rotator cuff, occurs via three overlapping phases. The first phase, or the inflammatory phase, involves several cytokines, inflammatory cells, and progenitor cells, and is the prime target phase for majority of biologic strategies. Tendon repair and regeneration is interplay of progenitor cells and growth factors in presence of appropriate scaffold and blood supply. This concept has helped us stratify our strategies for biologic augmentation of cuff repairs. However, 
no surgical technique till date has been able to reproduce the highly organized structure at the emphasis after a rotator cuff repair. At the best, we get a modified scar at the repair site. Now, biologic strategies to enhance rotator cuff repair, they fall into three categories. They could be cell-based therapies, growth factors, and scaffold augmentation. In this talk, I will focus on providing updates on the first two categories. Numerous growth factors participate during various phases of tendon repair. These cytokines stimulate migration, proliferation, and differentiation of progenitor cells at the repair site. Unfortunately, no single growth factor that predominates the healing process has been identified till date for rotator cuff repair or regeneration. Investigators have tried growth factor cocktails in preclinical studies, but they are not as effective because they lack the temporal relationship and absence of counter-regulatory control of growth factors, which is very important in the human body. So far, there are no clinical studies that have demonstrated efficacy with direct application of growth factors for rotator cuff repair. Platelet-rich plasma, as we all know, is an autologous biologic product derived from peripheral blood and contains concentrated platelets, which are rich source of cytokines and growth factors. Many of the cytokines that are involved in cuff healing are also found in high concentration in PRP, for example, TGF-beta, fibroblast growth factors, and insulin growth factors. The role of PRP in rotator cuff repair has been extensively investigated, and there are at least 18 clinical trials that have explored the role of PRP in rotator cuff repair. There is level one evidence that shows maybe PRP works, as it is associated with lower recare rates and improved outcomes. At the same time, an equal number of level one studies demonstrate that maybe it does not work. There's no significant difference between PRP and control groups with respect to retear rates or other outcomes as shown in these studies highlighted on the slide. Recent systematic reviews point towards benefit of PRP on retail rates and short-term outcomes which are superior to uh, groups without PRP. However, overall interpretation of these studies is difficult because of lack of standardization of the PRP preparation used in different studies. There is controversy regarding leukocyte-poor versus leukocyte-rich PRP controversy regarding concentration of platelets less than three times the concentration or more than three times, controversy related to fibrin content, use of anticoagulation or an activated, activating agent in the preparation. Additionally, delivery method for PRP is not optimized yet, and cost effectiveness has not been established, and all these factors further limit its widespread clinical use as of 2020. Let's move on to cell-based therapies. These uh, cell-based therapies include use of cellular agents that participate in repair via autocrine or paracrine pathways. Stem cells, as we all know, is the buzzword that everyone wants to hear as a solution for any kind of a biologic problem. The stem cells are, are of two main types, the embryonic stem cells and adult progenitor cells. For musculoskeletal regeneration, Adult connective tissue progenitors are only approved. They can be obtained from sources like bone marrow, adipose tissue, and many other sources. They can be used directly after harvest with or without concentration like BMAC, or they can be expanded in vitro prior to delivery at the repair site. A progenitor cell can directly transform into a tenocyte or these cells can release factors that transform the local pool of progenitor population and mature tenocyte when used at the site of repair. The least expensive cell-based strategy is the bone marrow stimulation or the crimson duvet technique that was popularized by Dr. Snyder. In this technique, the greater tuberosity is fenestrated to allow migration of progenitors from the bone marrow to the repair site. Although inexpensive, the true efficacy of this procedure is not fully established yet. 
Bone marrow aspirate concentrate or BMAC is a technique in which autologous bone marrow is concentrated to enrich the progenitor population before delivery to the site of repair. There is convincing basic science evidence that BMAC contains high concentration of progenitors and growth factors, but clinical evidence for efficacy of BMAC is limited. The study by Harnagu et al. is important to mention here. In their study, 45 patients with rotator cuff tears were treated with direct injection of concentrated bone marrow at the repair site compared to the controls who just had the repair. The group showed that the tears that had bone marrow injections had higher, significantly higher healing rates that were maintained at a mean follow-up of 10 years. This study is by far the most convincing evidence use of uh, bone marrow-derived mesenchymal stem cells, but these results are yet to be reproduced by other investigators. Adipose tissue is an upcoming and easily accessible source of adult progenitor cells. Typically, in this technique, a tissue is obtained, autologous tissue is obtained by liposuction. This tissue is then enzymatically digested to separate the stem cells, which are then expanded in culture prior to their clinical use. As of now, there is very limited evidence for efficacy of adipose-derived progenitor cells for rotator cuff healing. And there are uh, very few studies which have looked at partial tears or interstitial tears as a treatment option using autologous adipose tissue. Tendon progenitor cells, or TPC, can be isolated from tendon, and they have a potential to differentiate into other cells of mesenchymal origin. In our lab, uh, we've been working on uh, these uh, cells, and we have devised reproducible methods to isolate TPCs from rotator cuff tendon and expand them in vitro. We have successfully isolated TPCs from rat rotator cuff tendon and muscle tendon junction. And we have compared these progenitors to the rotator cuff muscle versus the adipose tissue and bone marrow. We found that the cells in rotator cuff muscle tendon junction behave more like tendons compared to the rotator cuff muscle or adipose tissue with respect to gene expression profile. We, we postulate that muscle tendon junction will be a viable option for isolating TPCs for cell-based therapy in chronic rotator cuff tears because the tendon substance is degenerative and would not have a necessary pool to harvest the cells. In near future, we intend to test the role of these TPCs in animal models of tendon repair. No surgical technique till date has shown true regeneration of rotator cuff emphasis at the repair site in animal model or clinically. There are certain challenges to rotator cuff regeneration and biologic augmentation. First of all, we have no single dominant identifiable growth factor that drives repair of a tendon. We don't have the transcription factors involved in signaling identified yet. The progenitor cells present in the tendon are in very low numbers, and in degenerative tissue, they are even further lower. The blood supply in the native tendon is limited, which further contributes uh, to poor healing at the repair site. In conclusion, majority of mechanical failure of rotator cuff repair occur at tendon suture interface, and the healing response is inadequate in these cases. No surgical repair has yet been successful in reproducing the structural organization of rotator cuff emphasis and healing largely occurs by forming scar tissue. Inconclusive efficacy and lack of standardization of PRP preparation is a major impediment to its use. Bone marrow stimulation, or crimson duvet, is an inexpensive strategy to augment rotator cuff repair, but its true efficacy is unknown. Cell-based therapies are still in the nascent stages of development, Indications and cost-effectiveness of biologic strategies need further refinement to justify the use in rotator cuff in the near future.
Thank you very much for patient listening. Okay. Well, thanks, Mandeep. Um, can everybody hear me? Hopefully. Um, you can see my screen. I'm sharing my screen now. Well, good evening. Um, thanks for having me, uh, Mandeep. I think this is a, a, a great uh, conference you've put together here. So I've been asked to talk about arthroscopic rotator cuff repair principles and practice. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll begin by saying that um, the emphasis of this talk is going to be on large and massive size rotator cuff tears and how, how we approach them. I will tell you that for those of us, including myself, who uh, basically um, in the beginning of our careers through our training program and then in the beginning of my career, you know, we did these things, uh, made the transition from formal open repairs to mini open to all arthroscopic technique. For the younger members of the audience out there, you probably don't have much experience uh, with uh, open and probably mini open repairs. And I think to some extent, uh, that's unfortunate because a lot of the techniques that I'm about to show you are really just those techniques that have been adapted from the open techniques that we, we used to employ. The same basic principles uh, apply here, uh, just in an arthroscopic uh, format. So we'll begin with some very important evidence-based assumptions. Uh, first assumption is that with modern uh, repair techniques, repairability uh, really is not a technical question anymore. We, we can repair these very large tears that you see here on your screen and get uh, pretty good stable constructs at the, uh, by the end of the procedure. We're going to define an irreparable rotator cuff tear for the purposes of this discussion as those, uh, uh, those where the, uh, the amount of fat exceeds the amount of muscle uh, on MRI scans. And then consequently, a massive rotator cuff tear is, is not necessarily an irreparable rotator cuff tear. Uh, for tonight's presentation, uh, the algorithm that we're gonna look at is uh, that highlighted in red. We're gonna be focusing on patients um, less than 70, although that's certainly not a hard and fast number. Um, patients with uh, less than uh, grade two fatty atrophy based on the Goutelier classification. So these are basically the five essential principles that I think are very important uh, to, uh, to apply when approaching these very large tears. Um, mobilizing them through a juxtaglenoid capsulotomy, posterior superior release, anterior superior release, tenant to tenon repair in those tears uh, uh, where that is applicable, and we'll go over that in a moment, and then a secure tendon to bone repair construct. So beginning with the juxtaglenoid capsulotomy, um, this is uh, a technique which begins intraarticularly. Uh, you can see here um, a, a blunt elevator is passed between the adhesed cuff and the superior labrum. You wanna keep in mind that the suprascapular nerve uh, lies as close as 15 millimeters medial to the supraglenoid tubercle, so you don't really want to be plunging this device, and we're releasing from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, and that will gain you uh, a few millimeters, um, but very important to do to start to release uh, the adhesed cuff. In the subacromial space, we'll then begin with a posterior superior release, uh, performing it with uh, a blunt shaver. You can see here the adhesions in the bottom right, and the shaver is releasing the adhesions uh, between the cuff and the undersurface of the scapular spine, and then using the blunt elevator, as you can see there, um, liberating the entire posterior inferior gutter. Moving on to the anterior superior release, I typically do that with uh, an ablation device that you can see there, um, followed by an elevator, and this release includes the coracohumeral ligament and the rotator interval capsule. In some tears, especially these large U-shaped tears and L-shaped tears, you will need to do some type of tenon to tenon or side to side sutures, otherwise known as a margin uh, convergence technique. 
And then, of course, uh, following a, uh, a thorough bone prep, a secure tenant to bone repair. And the goal is to get something that you see here on your right, which is a secure uh, repair with uh, no uh, gap formation uh, at time zero. Just a quick word about tenon slide. So what is a tenon slide? It's essentially you're moving the origin of either the supraspinatus or the infraspinatus laterally. Um, I, I don't do slides. I don't think uh, most of us have been doing slides within the uh, recent years because I think the majority of us will feel that this will weaken the muscle. Um, it's really non-anatomic, and I would uh, sooner prefer to do a partial repair uh, and leave a small gap than to uh, alter the anatomy. So uh, to summarize these sort of five essential uh, principles here, um, I don't perform interval slides. I do release the adhesed cuff through the various mobilization techniques that we just went through. Um, and I will advance the infraspinatus and for the subscapularis is necessary to, to get a force couple between the anterior and posterior tissues and leave a small gap, um, uh, essentially, uh, if needed, so uh, doing a partial repair as long as I can balance the force couples. I think it's important at the beginning of all of these cases to spend the time to do a thorough examination and manipulation under anesthesia. You'd be surprised how many patients you've seen in the office, you bring them to the operating room and they're stiff. And I think that not doing this in the beginning sort of risks post-operative stiffness. So I think this is a very important maneuver and exercise to do at the beginning of every surgery. Um, I, I do my cup repairs in the lateral decubitus position uh, with uh, skin traction, as you can see there. I have 10 pounds of skin traction on the arm. When I, uh, I'm working in the subacromial space, I'll, I'll rotate the arm, as you see here, bringing the arm into a deduction. Um, I'll just freeze that video right now. So by doing that, um, it does three things. Uh, first of all, it gets the arm out of the way, and I can easily manipulate instruments from both sides of the shoulder. Uh, it also opens up the subacromial space by a few millimeters, giving me uh, better access to the tissues. Um, and it also finally, uh, it, it assures me as I'm doing my releases and repairing my tissues that I'm not fixing these tissues in abduction under tension. Uh, so you want to fix these in a, in a relaxed state with the arm at the side. Um, so those are the three reasons why I move the arm into this position. Uh, these are the basic uh, portals, as you can see here. Um, certainly, um, uh, additional portals. Uh, may be used, and I wouldn't hesitate to make additional portals if needed to gain access to different portions of the, uh, of the tear. I uh, begin with a, a complete uh, inspection of the glenohumeral joint. I think you should have a good plan for the biceps tendon ahead of time uh, and uh, in instruct the patient that this is what may happen, whether it be a tenotomy or a tenodesis. Um, I will say that if I, I do a tenodesis, my preference is an arthroscopic soft tissue tenodesis, but I have no problems with um, folks that decide to do a, a open subpec tenodesis. Um, but you should have a plan for the biceps tendon um, ahead of time. Uh, you can see here in the right, looking at the undersurface, the articular surface of the cuff. Um, uh, you can see that from the, from the joint side. And then you want to do a, uh, inspect the subscapularis. This is a posterior lever arm push test. You can see here the arthroscopic visualization and what's being done uh, outside. Uh, the arm is being uh, uh, internally rotated and posteriorly translated. That will allow the subscapularis uh, to stand up at attention. You see here the tissue that's termed the comet tissue, which directs you to the upper border of the subscapularis. And you can see a, a nice attachment to the subscapularis. This is the time to repair the subscapularis if there is a tear here. Um, you want to go ahead and release any scarred interval tissue. Uh, this is a subacute uh, rotator cuff tear. You can see how quickly the rotator interval scars in, and you want to release that tissue. It's very important to do that uh, so as uh, uh, to reduce uh, uh, post-operative stiffness. 
And then you see here that view of the subscapularis with this posterior lever arm uh, push. Uh, moving into the subacromial space, you do need to do a fairly uh, thorough bursectomy for a variety of reasons. You need to be able to visualize the entire tear, and uh, you, you want to uh, remove this bursal tissue because it will capture your sutures and get in the way during your repair. Uh, this is just uh, going back into the joint, showing this uh, 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 juxtaglenoid uh, capsulotomy, um, uh, a perilabor release. You see here we've released it just with a cautery uh, first and then passing that blunt instrument and then back to the uh, bursal side. It's very important uh, once you've cleared out all the bursal tissue and you, before you start throwing in anchors uh, to uh, assess tear morphology. Uh, these, are, these are the basic uh, tear patterns that have been described. Um, you should be familiar with the various tear patterns, and it's important to visualize this through multiple portals because what may seem like a simple crescent tear looking from the posterior portal may actually be uh, an L-shaped tear, which requires a completely different suture uh, configuration or repair configuration. So you want to initially assess tear mobility and then go ahead and perform your, your releases as we discussed. Again, viewing from multiple portals and working through multiple portals. I do utilize traction sutures. It does tend to free up my hands. You can pass a traction suture um, initially through a cannula and then replace the cannula with the suture outside the cannula so it doesn't occupy space within the cannula and get entangled with your other instruments and sutures that you're passing. Again, the shoulders in a deduction. This is just an example, the bottom right video of a bursal sided tear. You can get fooled and it looks like the, the, there's no rotator cuff tear from the uh, intra-articular side when you're doing a glenohumeral arthroscopy, and it's only when you put the scope into the subacromial space and clear out the tissue that you realize you have a near complete uh, bursal sided tear. Typically, we'll go ahead and complete that tear, release it um, where you see there, and then do a formal uh, uh, repair. You want to do a thorough footprint prep, um, removing those bony excrescences, which you just saw, creating a, uh, a, a bed for healing. Um, Dr. Uh, Burke just gave a wonderful presentation on uh, uh, biologics, and this is a, just an example of a microfracture uh, technique, releasing marrow elements um, uh, in the hopes that this will stimulate a healing uh, response. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, um, different tear patterns uh, will require some tenon to tenon uh, repair. This is a margin convergence technique. We're now viewing from the lateral portal, and in general, we'll pass sutures from apex out laterally, tying as we go, and then uh, the final repair will be tenon to bone. Um, so proceed from apex to lateral. Uh, it's important, I think, before you start putting in suture anchors is to plan out your configuration. I typically um, will look at the tear through multiple portals once I've done all my releases, and then I have decided on the repair construct at that point. So your suture anchor placement is going to follow that, that picture, that mental picture that you have in your mind as to how this is going to come together at the end. Um, these anchors uh, should, uh, you should span the footprint appropriately. Uh, they're typically placed at about a 45 degree angle to decrease uh, pull out. Um, test each anchor after you place it by pulling up on the sutures. If it's going to pull out, you want to know now um, and make sure that those uh, sutures slide. I typically use uh, uh, double loaded uh, anchors. Uh, this is a double row construct. The medial row is placed just uh, adjacent to the articular margin. And then the uh, lateral row for our suture bridge. Uh, limbs is placed lateral to the, uh, just adjacent to the footprint. There are a variety of ways of passing sutures through, through tissue. Um, this is, it could be done through a direct uh, mechanism, as you see here. There are a variety of instruments that are uh, commercially available for this, or you can shuttle sutures using uh, various shuttling uh, devices. In general, for the majority of pairs, sutures are passed. Uh, beginning anteriorly and proceeding posteriorly. I don't tie anything until the end. Once sutures are passed from anterior to posterior, I'll begin tying from posterior to anterior. Um, if I am going to do 
uh, a single row construct, I will typically uh, uh, use Mason Allen sutures where the horizontal uh, mattress suture from each anchor uh, acts as a ripstop uh, and a simple suture is placed over that, um, securing the tissue to the prepared uh, bony bed. And then again, knot tying proceeds um, from posterior to anterior. A couple of pearls on suture passing. Uh, sort of the, the weak link or the most common mechanism of failure is the suture pulling through tissue. So you want to take large medial bites of tissue um, just lateral to the muscular tendon at junction. These devices are, are, are sized for that. Um, you're going to do a shuttling technique. Again, same principles take uh, large bites of tissue. This is an L shaped tear that you can see on your right, and we're going to secure that uh, antro uh, lateral edge um, and bring that down with a shuttling technique. There are a lot of knotless um, uh, uh, anchors out now, and I think they've become more and more popular. Um, you will have to tie knots, though. I can tell you, even if you use knotless devices, you will have to tie knots. And I think it's just very important to, uh, to practice that and become proficient uh, with that um, along the way. So this is sort of an example of a final construct. Um, you like to see blood there at the, uh, at the side of the uh, tendon reattachment. Uh, and again, no time zero gap formation. A uh, couple of words about lateral row uh, and double row repairs. Um, which are certainly very popular and, and certainly biomechanically very sound. You do need to be aware of osteopenic bone. Um, these uh, screw-in devices uh, can pull out. Uh, you want to make sure that these suture limbs do span the entire uh, breadth of the tear. Um, you want to avoid dog ear formation. I'll use these sort of luggage tag sutures. You can see there a looped one at the end uh, to avoid uh, uh, dog ears. And, and you do not want to overtension these because this can certainly cause um, stiffness and, and has a higher uh, rate of failure. Again, uh, fixing these with the arm in a deduction, mobilizing the tissue um, will all help to avoid overtensioning your construct. This is just a, an extreme example of anchor overload. This patient um, came to me um, fairly recently after a cuff repair. You can see the graded tuberosity here. I think there's more plastic than bone uh, in this area. Um, she fell, fractured a graded tuberosity. The stress riser, of course, was uh, all of the implants in the graded tuberosity. Um, and once all of these implants were taken out, which you can see here on the bottom right, you're left with a very difficult situation, a big void, um, and uh, a recurrent cuff tear. So again, you want to plan the placement of these anchors out ahead of time um, and make sure you get the most out of uh, uh, your anchors, double loaded sutures, and don't overload the tuberosity. Um, here's a case of osteopenic bone. Um, this is a, a large recurrent tear. This is actually a, a physician uh, tear that I had fixed um, um, about uh, 12, 12 or so years ago. Um, had a fall, retorus rotator cuff. I thought I had a pretty good construct there. You can see there a combination of simple sutures and suture bridging techniques. You can see here's some remnant of old suture material from my previous repair so many years ago. Uh, and then about six weeks um, post-op, he came to see me with uh, pain in his middle deltoid. And you can see there the pull out of this uh, lateral row anchor. Fortunately, we were able to get him to hold on for another couple of months. Uh, and then I was able to retrieve the anchor and the cuff tear was was healed, so we, we were certainly fortunate on, uh, in this case. So just to wrap things up, um, putting it all together, a view of the glenohumeral joint, here we are, we're gonna go ahead and do a uh, release of that uh, uh, bicep and go through all the different um, mobilization techniques that I spoke about. I'm gonna speed this up for the purposes of getting on with our conference. Um, this is a, a fairly young patient in his late 40s who had an unfortunate fall. You see here a really a massive size rotator cuff tear. Um, relatively poor quality tissue for someone so young. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and do a combination of side to side sutures to make that into a, a nice crescent shaped tear, prepare our bone bed, and then the process of placing our medial row anchors, passing our stitches, 
tying our stitches and then selecting limbs for a, uh, a lateral row. Uh, as you can see there. Uh, so just some important points for summarizing. Um, you really do need to identify these tear patterns. And the only way to do that is to put the scope in multiple portals. Don't rely on just keeping the scope in the posterior portal the entire time. You're definitely going to miss certain important characteristics of the tear that's going to have an effect on your construct. You want to do a thorough bursectomy and footprint prep uh, to create a nice uh, bed for healing. Spend a lot of time mobilizing, releasing, assessing, and then doing it again. Mobilizing, releasing, assessing through all of the techniques that I went through. Large conversion sutures uh, uh, are very helpful in converting these very large tears to more manageable tears. Want to rotate the arm. Just because it's in uh, the lateral decubitus position and the arm is uh, in traction doesn't mean you can't rotate it to gain access to different portions of the tear in the shoulder. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, and don't overcrowd your tuberosity with a lot of implants, um, placing the median lateral row anchors um, uh, as far apart uh, as, as, as you can so as not to overcrowd the, uh, the bony real estate there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rakito. That was a, a very thoughtful presentation. Uh, I am going to invite uh, Dr. Kwan next for his presentation. While Dr. Kwan is pulling up his presentation, uh, Dr. Rakito, one question for you. Uh, so how long is your duration of uh, sling immobilization after massive tears? Or, or basically, when do you start moving them? Six weeks. Six weeks. Six I'll weeks. let them do some general pendulums and codmen um, early on, but I, I, will, I will immobilize them at six weeks. And that doesn't mean just throw the sling away at six weeks either. It means a gradual wean from the sling. I think. Um, uh, in general, my experience is that these patients do not get stiff, and um, dealing with a, 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 a failed repair is much more difficult than dealing with a stiff shoulder. So, um, six weeks. Thank you. Dr. Kwan, all yours. All right. So, if you guys could hear me. Uh, so, the topic of my talk is uh, what to do in terms of a salvage option for patients with uh, massive rotator cuff tears that are not repairable. So I don't have any relevant disclosures. Uh, as a background, when I started my practice back in 2003, uh, treatment options for massive cuff tears were as uh, listed here. So we could do a repair, we could do debridement, uh, which uh, encompassed basically uh, resecting the greater tuberosity to minimize impingement pain. Uh, you could also try to do a repair with some kind of a graft. Back then, the, the common uh, form of an augment used to be small intestine submucosa that you see right here. We used to do tendon transfers, and we used to also do hemiarthroplasties with CTA heads. And CTA heads uh, basically just mean cuff tear arthropathy heads, which is a hemiarthroplasty with a humeral head that's extended out to cover the greater tuberosity. Now, coming to this year in 2020, uh, things have changed, but things have essentially stayed the same. So really not a whole huge difference. Obviously, repair, tuberoplasty is still maintained. Instead of doing the repair with some kind of patch, we're now doing something called superior capsule reconstruction as a salvage. And this is something that Dr. Jaswar is going to mention. We still do let them to dorsal tendon transfer. However, more recently, a different type of tendon transfer, specifically lower trapezius tendon transfer, has become a little more popular. But obviously, it builds on the same concept of a, of a, a, a lat tendon transfer as well. But probably the one that makes the biggest difference is the uh, reverse shoulder replacement. Now, before, we, like I said, it used to be hemiarthroplasty, uh, and essentially just trying to minimize the arth arthritis-related pain. But now we could actually uh, compensate for the torn rotator cuff, and this has probably really made the biggest difference. Uh, the use of reverse replacement, and Dr. Zuckerman is going to talk about that. Uh, something new uh, that's been coming around for the past few years is the subacromial balloon spacer. Unfortunately, we still don't have a lot of data on this, but we'll talk about all this as well. Now, I should also uh, specify that before we go on to talk about some of these salvage options, I need to highlight the fact that, as Dr. Rokito mentioned, repair is clearly preferential to any of these salvage options that I'm going to discuss uh, later. Uh, in fact, there's data that seems to suggest that even a partial repair may be a better 
uh, to a salvage option that we're going to discuss. So uh, basically the main message here is never assume repairability. Just because a tear is large, it does not mean it's not repairable. So we really want to be sure that the rotator cup really is not repairable before you start considering any of these salvage options. So we're going to start talking about some of these salvage options. The first is tuberoplasty. The ideal patient for uh, tuber arthroscopic tuberoplasty are patients who's got an irreparable rotator cuff tear, but somehow their shoulder is balanced. So they can raise their arms. They can raise their arm all the way. And their main complaint, in addition to a little bit of weakness, but their main complaint is pain, meaning they have impingement pain. They say they can't really do anything overhead, and that's what's causing them problems. They have minimal arthritic degeneration. And like I said, these are patients who are willing to tolerate a little bit of weakness around the shoulder. So these are generally older patients who have a relatively low functional demand. The concept of the tear, uh, concept of the tuberoplasty is basically you're reducing the impingement pain. So in the past, what most of us would do, would do an acromioplasty, but as you do the acromioplasty, you may damage the CA ligament, which may then uh, lead to superior escape of the humor head and rotator cuff arthropathy. So the CA arch is maintained, and instead of reducing the acromion, you basically reset a part of the greater tuberosity and make the entire proximal humerus as a, uh, as a single sphere, so that basically there's going to be no impingement pain. Obviously, when you're in there, you're going to try to eliminate other sources of pain, whether it be biceps tendon, AC joint, et cetera, and that also improves the pain of these patients as well. Uh, can we run the slide, please? This is just a short video. I won't go into detail, but basically it's an arthroscopic uh, tuberoplasty. You can see that I'm seeing this patient with a right shoulder. I'm using a posterior portal visualization. Uh, the uh, instrument, the, sh the burr is coming from the lateral portal. And you can see that I'm just taking the greater tuberosity down. I usually start from the bicipital groove and then go uh, posteriorly. And you can see there I looked into the articular surface to make sure that this really is uh, making a spear and basically minimizing the greater tuberosity from impinging against the acromion. You carry that posteriorly until you start seeing the native or intact uh, rotator cuff. Now, this is a balanced shoulder where patients are still able to raise their arm. So whatever rotator cuff that's intact, you want to make sure you do not violate that. All right, can we go back to the main deck, please? So tuberoplasty has been described. Initially, it was described as an open procedure, although more recently, majority of the, majority of the surgeons are performing this arthroscopically. Probably the biggest follow-up, or at least the longest follow-up, uh, was the study that was uh, um, published by our Korean colleagues, 16 patients, but they had about an eight-year follow-up. Their patients noted significant impairment in their pain, going from uh, a DAS of 7 down to about 2.3. And a constant score is about 60. So this is a pretty good result. Obviously, it's not an excellent result. But considering that it's a salvage procedure, I think this is a pretty good uh, outcome. Uh, there did note one revision uh, where a patient complained of persistent pain and it had to undergo reverse replacement. Uh, at NYU, we have also been looking at my personal experience on patients who were treated with uh, arthroscopic tuberoplasty. So far, we've identified 22 patients with a minimum of two-year follow-up. Uh, the patient seems to have done fairly well, certainly in the intraoperative and immediate post-op period. There were no complications. Their final PROMIS score as well as ASES score was about 84, so significant improvements. The patients were barely pretty happy. Uh, I did have five failures. Four of these were treated with reverse replacement, and one patient was treated with superior capsule reconstruction. Interesting, even the five failure, uh, patients with failures uh, still said that they thought arthroscopic tuberoplasty was uh, was. Uh, worth it, and they, in a similar situation, they would proceed with the, with the tuberoplasty again. All right, so next topic that we're going to talk about is a tendon transfer. Uh, as I mentioned, probably the, uh, the one that's been gotten the most amount of data uh, that we have is latissimus dorsi tendon transfer. Now, these ideally, you, know, you want to do this for patients that are physiologically young who could retrain their muscles to do something that they had not done before. Uh, you want to have intact deltoid and intact subscapular. So we're talking about patients with posterior superior rotator cuff tears. Uh, patients should not have any much arthritis, meaning they don't really have a significant pain uh, in their shoulder. And their primary complaint is weakness, meaning they cannot raise their arm. 
Uh, generally, patients are doing better if they actually have a minimal active elevation to about 80 degrees. So uh, this would be an ideal candidate. As you can see here, the patient cannot raise his arm past about 100, 110 degrees. Good internal rotation and belly press suggesting that the, um, his uh, subscapularis is well maintained. So in a patient like this, you would do a lat transfer. Um, and lat transfer is really big surgery and it's, it's quite morbid. So this is a patient, the head is to your left, uh, the arm is uh, on the top of the shoulder, I mean, on top of the slide, and you can look at the dis initial dissection. Sorry, and what you should notice is that when you see the latissimus dorsi, it's right next to the radial nerve. So the inferior border of the latissimus dorsi tendon insertion is bordering on the radial nerve. So during the dissection, you obviously have to be very, very careful. Uh, the tendon itself is fairly broad and wide, and once you harvest that, then you're gonna make a second incision on top of the shoulder uh, for, the rotator, uh, for the rotator cuff around the greater tuberosity, and you pass the latissimus tendon from the posterior wound into the superior wound, as you see here. And once you do that, you just kind of fix it to the greater tuberosity. Uh, these patients do okay. Once again, as, as Wen mentioned, it's a salvage procedure. So the patients do uh, see significant improvements in their motion. Uh, as well as their constant scores or their clinical optimum scores, and many patients are showing satisfaction. But once again, as a salvage procedure, patients are not going to uh, get 180 degrees of elevation with a normal, like a normal shoulder. Uh, as we just mentioned, the uh, latissimus dorsi tendon transfer is a very big surgery with lots of morbidity with long rehab. Uh, as a result, Many of the surgeons are now recommending a lower trapezius tendon transfer. This is a, a sort of a smaller incision, not quite as morbid. But the patient that would be ideal for tendon transfer of this type, the lower trapezius, is the same, meaning these are patients with posterior superior rotator cuff tears with minimal arthritis, minimal active elevation to at least about 60 degrees. And these patients' primary complaint is weakness, not pain. Can we in the second slide, uh, second video, please? So this is a patient that I did uh, with uh, uh, lower tra tendon transfer. The patient is set up uh, in a semi-sitting position. The incisions are pretty small, so that I do make a small incision uh, by the scapular spine and identify the uh, lower trapezius. And lower trapezius is very easy to identify. It's one of the first tendons that you run into on the medial border of the scap inferior scapular spine. So once you harvest it, you control it by passing some sutures, and then you do some blunt dissection. Despite the, the uh, dissection and mobilization, the tendon really doesn't travel all the way. In fact, there's almost no way it's gonna reach the greater tuberosity. So we do have to use a bridging gap. And for that, we're gonna use the Achilles tendon, but as a preparation, you get into the shoulder arthroscopically and prepare the shoulder joint. As you saw there, the greater tuberosity is bare with no uh, remaining rotator cuff. I make the tunnel arthroscopically, and then you take the Achilles tendon graft, and you pass it from the posterior wound into the shoulder joint. And you can see here that the, the sutures that are securing the Achilles tendon is passed into the shoulder. Once that's in, you can see the tendon now coming in. You can see that on the upper left corner. And then the tendon is placed right over the greater tuberosity. And it's it's going to get fixed with a couple of suture anchors. Can we speed the, up the, uh, the video just a little bit, fast forward a bit? Thank you. So once that's done, you take the Achilles tendon and you fix it to the latissimus uh, tendon that you identified. Usually, I just split the Achilles tendon, pass it through the latissimus, I'm sorry, not the latissimus, the lower trap, and then basically tie it secure with sutures. And unlike the latissimus transfer, uh, you'll see at the end here that the overall incisions are much smaller, and this is certainly not nearly as morbid as the big uh, left tendon transfer, as you see here. Okay, go back to the slides, please. 
Uh, unfortunately, there is not a whole lot of clinical data. Probably the best data is from al at Mayo Clinic. He just published a study where he had 41 patients that were treated with the lower trap transfer. Fairly short follow-up was uh, only about a year. Uh, they did notice significant improvement in gross majority of the patients. And four flexion went from 70 to about 130, and external rotation from 25 to 47. Once again, as a salvage procedure, the patients are now able to raise their arm above head. And obviously, because of that, their function capacity has significantly increased. Now, we should, they did also note that patients did have negative prognostic factors, meaning if they had a hamada grade 3, which means the proximal humerus, I'm sorry, if, which means that the humor head had migrated proximally. If the patient has significant pseudoparalysis, meaning their active elevation was less than 50 or 60, clearly these patients did poorly. So overall, tendon transfers can, do have high morbidity, uh, but for the appropriate patient with prolonged rehabilitation, they can do fairly well. Uh, obviously, we have to understand that this is mostly to improve motion, and these are patients who generally don't complain of significant pain. So patient selection is quite, quite important, and obviously an ideal candidate has to be uh, uh, to identify it. This is something new. The last, one of the last things we're going to talk about is a subacromial balloon uh, insertion. Subacromial balloon is a uh, translucent biodegradable polymer. It's essentially literally a balloon that you put into subacromial space. It does come into different, three different sizes, and the polymer only lasts for about 12 months, and the polymer is filled with saline. And basically what it does is by inserting this uh, uh, a balloon in the subacromial space, you put the humor head down and have it centered against the glenoid and prevent proximal migration. Uh, so as a case example, this case was sent to me from Dr. Joel Booth at, uh, at Rothman Institute. Uh, he was on the uh, initial study, so was allowed to use the balloon. As far as I know, the balloon is still not uh, commercially available or at least not widely available in the United States, at least not yet. So this is a patient with a large cuff tear that was not repairable. And he, what the Dr. Abu told me is that this uh, balloon is very, very simple. Basically, this is an introduced, this is an inserter. The balloon is coming in in the middle slide here. You can see the balloon coming in. And the final slide is after the balloon is still. So basically, you put the use an inserter to insert the balloon, and then you just basically use a syringe to put the saline into the balloon, and you're done. So literally two minutes. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, there's not a whole lot of data on that. There's a lot of sort of small amount of data. Um, uh, probably the best data we have available is from Europe because our European colleagues have been using this a little more uh, for a longer period of time. Um, there's a study that was published last year uh, with 46 shoulders with a balloon spacer with a long, fairly long follow-up of three years. The patients noticed significant improvements uh, in the Oxford com Functional Outcome Score. They did have a couple of failures, but they also had 82% patient satisfaction. One interesting thing here, as I mentioned to you before, the balloon spacer is really only good for about one year. So the, the thought here is that after one year, the balloon is disintegrated and the fluid is absorbed by the body. But these uh, authors noted that the patient still had good results, or at least they maintained their good results up to three years. So we still don't know exactly what the mechanism of the balloons are. Uh, so, like I said, there's minimal clinical data, at least not in the United States, and, and the exact mechanism of improvement and exact clinical indications are still not, uh, uh, not identified. All right, so overall, in conclusion, obviously, you're going to have patients with uh, rotator cuff that's not repairable. What you want to do is obviously eliminate their sources of pain and also, if you can, restore or maintain their active elevation so their functional capacity is maintained. Now, there are a number of salvage options, and each one of these have to be appropriately detailed for individual patients because the individual needs will be different. Now, I will also say that regardless of my uh, approach, uh, a patient who's had one of these salvage surgery is not going to get, not going to be rock climbing like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kwan. Uh in the essence of time, we are going to move with our next talk uh, on superior capsule reconstruction by Dr. Jazrawi. While he's pulling up his uh, slides, Dr. Kwan, question for you. So what's your post-op uh, protocol for uh, tendon transfers, the trapezius transfer? Yeah, How long do you transfer? 
Yeah, so with tendon transfers, I would immobilize for about at least six weeks. Uh, passive and active assisted motion from week six to about uh, three, uh, week 12, so about three months. Uh, and some gentle strengthening, and then start incorporating biofeedback after that. Thank you. All right, so we are going to move ahead with uh, the next talk. Dr. Jezravi, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Mandeep. All right, we're going to try to get through this quickly. Uh, my disclosure is nothing necessarily relevant other than some research support from Arthrex, who makes the SCR patch. So what we're dealing with is this. Uh, the, the prior presenter showed various cases. This is a failed cuff repair, big uh, gap there. Um, so what do we know about debridement uh, alone? Well, the concern is that there's limited benefit with poor return to function, despite some uh, uh, reports out there suggesting some good benefits. What about the aggressive releases uh, allowing a partial repair that were referred to by Dr. Akito? Well, maybe some pain relief. Maybe limited functional improvement, but at least in some of the most of the papers, they show deterioration over time. So, what about the lat transfer? Dr. Kwan just spoke about it. Big surgery, even the trapezius uh, transfer, big surgery, um, complex surgery, and at least in the studies that are out there, marginal improvement in most of the patients. So, what about these patch type graphs for bridging the defects? These were brought up. The traditional one, the, the original one discussed by Snyder, where you're attaching the rotator cuff to the um, to the humeral head, so the native rotator cuff. Problems with this? Well, there's no medial attachment. You're attaching to tissue that's poor, and you get up a you you end up getting a situation where there's high high tearing or splitting, like you know splitting in these genes. Um, what about reverse total shoulder arthroplasty? Well, there are problems with that as well. Fractures. Not an ideal option in a young patient without OA, limited lifespan, high complication rate. And there's a lot of potential pitfalls with reverses. The key thing to look out for, and Dr. Zuckerman will probably get into this, is the painful, massive, irreparable cuff uh, tear in a patient without arthritis but has full active elevation. Those are the ones that don't do as well with a reverse. So what about superior capsule reconstruction? We all know the history, Dr. Mahata in Japan, he didn't have reverses available to him. He sought a better method for treating these irreparable cuff tears. He utilized tensor fascia lata, autograft, anchored into the glenoid and the humeral head. The, the goal was to recreate superior stability in the glenohumeral joint and prevent that superior escape. Um, in the United States, we use this robust dermal allograft. Again, just easier uh, avoiding the, the morbidity associated with the tensor fascia lata. It is thinner. It's three to four millimeters thick as opposed to the tensor fascia lata, which is about six to eight millimeters thick. We can get into this later on. Um, but the goals of the treatment remain the same. It's to prevent the superior escape of the humerus during shoulder range of motion to allow that forced couple to work, minimize impingement of the humerus on the inferior chromium, get pain relief, allow for improved function of the shoulder, the shoulder Secondary to recruitment of the deltoid once superior escape is eliminated. So when you look at the biomechanics of it, and th this was uh, nicely done by Mahata, where he looked at three constructs. One where he looked at the superior, uh, the the um, the patch where you you didn't anchor it into the bone medially or didn't anchor it into the glenoid. He looked at the typical SCR, and then he looked at a combination of of both the traditional patching above and the SCR. But the bottom line, what the key take home of the biomechanics are, you really need to anchor into the glenoid to get the, uh, uh, that superior migration eliminated. So that's where you fully restore um, the uh, subacromial contact pressure and also decrease that superior translation. So the medial contact into the bone is critical. So can you run this video, please? So I think everyone has seen this video, and the, the, the concept is that if you could see it, despite pulling on this and the tension, you really can't get that superior escape. But once you cut the patch, it just migrates superiorly very easily. And that's what we're trying to prevent with the this, this superior capsule reconstruction. Okay, next slide. OK, 
Okay, so what are the indications for the uh, SCR? It's uh, intolerable pain and or unacceptable dysfunction, uh, an amassable, irreparable rotator cuff tear, typically the super or infraspinatus, failed prior treatments, minimal rotator cuff arthropathy or osteoarthritis, and typically it's a gutalier stage three or four. Contraindications, irreparable subscap tear, though that can be reconstructed as well, uh, with grafting, non-functional deltoid muscle, and glenohumeral osteoarthritis. Um, you could run this slide, please, this video. Okay, so this is a case of the 54-year-old gentleman. This is the diagnostic scope. He had a prior failed double row. We did a biceps tenotomy on him to start the case, and then we were getting set up to do the superior capsular reconstruction on him. Next slide. You could run this video. So the first thing you want to do is start to debride the area. And I think this is key. You really need to, need to get a good look at the glenoid neck, debride these old sutures out on the humeral head, and, and really get a clean bed so you can see what you're doing. Next slide. Uh, run the video, please. So the first thing, I, I put my glenoid anchors in. So you really want to do this, get this... Uh, um, basically draping over the glenoid, both at the uh, uh, the 1 o'clock position and the 11 o'clock position. I use three anchors now. This was an earlier case of mine where I used two anchors. Um, you, you put your swivel locks laterally, again, two with the tape here, uh, into the humeral head. Next slide. You can stop the video. Run the video. Okay, now I think the key part of this uh, of the uh, this procedure is really getting the the graft sizing right uh, because you don't want to make the it, it too tight or too small or or too big so it doesn't have tension. So uh, there are various devices out there that aid in in doing this, and uh, the goal is to just do it accurately. Uh, run the video. Okay, now the next part is suture management. These are brought through the lateral portal and dock. These are the glenoid uh, anchors. And then now you've got your measurements, and the next step is to take the graft and cut the graft down. Uh, run the video. So there are a lot of steps to this procedure as you go through it, but the, the idea is to try to be as accurate as possible. And then once this is uh, cut, then you'll take this to the, you know, to the patient and to start passing the, uh, the sutures through. I think the key is through that, uh, uh, again, here's a shot where you're next to the patient. You can use a variety of devices to pass it through. This tissue tends to be thick. Um, but you go through this sequence where you pass the, uh, the medial sutures, the ones that are going to be on the glenoid, medially in a mattress-type fashion. And then you, you, you pull these pull sutures through to allow the graft to be pulled in. You can stop the video. And then that's brought through the uh, portal. And then what you get, you could run this video. So now that you, you've got the graft in, you, you've done the pulley technique to pull it in, then it's all about, you know, tying these sutures on the graft. So you tie medially first. And then once you tie these medially and cut, there, there are various devices now that you don't even have to tie medially. These are the lateral um, swivel tapes that you'll then use to secure it on the uh, humeral head laterally. In the sake of time, we could move to the next slide, please. You could stop the video. Okay. Run the video. And then, you know, you talk about additional fixation, and we can get into this in the Q&A. You could see here I'm attaching it to the, uh, the posterior cuff here uh, with the graft in place, and there's infraspinatus being sort of tied in. And uh, you can then do the same thing similarly anteriorly. Uh, you can go stop the video, go to the next slide. Run the video. And then you sort of get the, a look at this final construct where you have the, um, the graft interposed between the subscap anteriorly and the infraspinatus laterally, uh, posteriorly, sorry. 
So the literature is expanding with adoption of the superior capsule reconstruction as a primary option for irreparable rotator cuff tears. So there's some, you know, good data out there suggesting reasonable results. In this study, they looked at pain control. There, there was significant pain control and improved function. Um, the acromiohumeral distance was decreased. The ASES, ASES score improved significantly, and 83% of the patients had no graft tear or tendon re-tear. So in summary, superior capsule reconstruction is a primary option for massive irreparable rotator cuff tears without major OA. Um, there's improvements in their chromiohumeral distance, uh, VAS and ASCS scores. It provides treatment options without burning bridges. Other considerations that we could discuss in the questions, the type of allograft. Well, Mahata's initial study used fasciolata. Um, that's much thicker than the, the humeral dermal grafts that we have here, uh, which are only about three or four millimeters in size. And whether you do suturing to the back or the front, um, there's various people that uh, advocate both. But the, the key to understand is I think even with the grafts we use here in the States, they do not fully restore humeral translation. And there's some significant elongation of it, which would make sense uh, um, uh, with our – uh, results which are not as good as Mahata's results. Graph thickness we spoke about, four, four millimeters versus eight millimeter thick fasciolata allograft. Our grafts are three millimeters. And then acromioplasty. Um, in cases where acromioplasty were, were done, it markedly decreased subacromial contact area, um, but really had no effect on humeral head position, superior translation, or contact pressure. So whether you do it or not um, is really debatable. So in summary, set expectations cautiously when you're doing this procedure. I consider it a salvage procedure. It's technically challenging. You should tell your patients that they should expect uh, reverse arthroplasty in the future. And uh, But my feeling is it can't be an alternative to, uh, especially a young patient without OA, talk. to I'm a reverse to talk uh, with an 18 to 20%, 24% failure rate in some RSAs. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jezravi. That was a very elegant presentation. Uh, we are going to move to the last but not the least, uh, Dr. Zuckerman, who is going to talk to us about reverse total shoulder orthoplasty in the setting of irreparable rotator cuff tears while Dr. Zuckerman is pulling up his presentation. Uh, Dr. Jezravi, quick question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the cost effectiveness or cost component of SCR? Well, if you if you compare it to uh, the reverse arthroplasty price, uh, I, I think it's much cheaper. So I think that's one. It, it depends on what you're comparing it to. Um, so you've got the graft and the anchors. I, I, I still think they're cheaper than the reverse. So cost, for me, it's all about trying to provide the patient with a, a good option. So uh, if you pick the right patient for the procedure, and, and that patient is the younger patient, that can't lift their arm up, that doesn't have a repairable cuff, that has no arthritis. I think there's a role in that patient um, uh, to do the SCR rather than do a reverse. And uh, another follow-up question on that. Do you bill it as a rotator cuff? Is it billed as a rotator cuff repair, or uh, are there any other nuances to billing for superior capsular reconstruction? Yeah. I, I bill it as a rotator cuff repair, and then whether you do the biceps or, or not, uh, you could add that in. But uh, the un, you can also try it as an unlisted code, which I have not done. Thank you. Dr. Zuckerman, all over to you. Thank you, Mandeep. Uh, uh, Lace, perhaps you can bill it as a, a part one of a reverse shoulder replacement. You know, that, that code would work, <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> No, I, I only true. said that because I, like I only that. said that be, because you were very, very negative on the reverse, right? Unnecessarily <laughs> negative, I thought. But we'll, we, we will see. But before, before I start, uh, I do want to say that even though, even though uh, I'm the chair of this department, I'm, I continue to be impressed by what people are doing. I mean, the, the, the science and the biologics, the technical aspects 
of the presentations here today are really, really astounding to me and very impressive. And I, and I live in the middle of it. So I congratulate all my colleagues on not only what their talks, but their, their great, uh, their great uh, techniques that they're using. And that goes for Dr. Josh Rowley also. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about uh, the use of the uh, prosthesis as a, an option for massive irreparable tears. These are my disclosures relevant for my role as a design surgeon for a shoulder arthroplasty system. So as was pointed out, before the development of reverse shoulder arthroplasty, the prosthetic options for patients with massive irreparable cuff tears really were limited to those with arthritis, in which arthritis was the primary source of pain. If, you, if they had pain, you had a good chance of relieving the pain. That if that was the primary goal. However, if functional improvement was the primary goal, then oftentimes it was unpredictable at best. And as Dr. Kwan pointed out, the, uh, the role of hemiarthroplasty with the so-called cuff tear arthropathy head was utilized, but with, with not to any great success. And we had our own limited success. This is a paper we published a number of years ago. Uh, patients with rotator cuff arthropathy right, different than what we're talking about, for hemiarthroplasty. And in a limited goals way, the patients were satisfied, but by no means very good. So to put this in context, when you consider arthroplasty for rotator cuff tears, there are three clinical scenarios. The first is what we're going to talk about here, the massive irreparable rotator cuff tear in the absence of arthritis. The rotator cuff deficient shoulder with arthritis or cuff tear arthropathy is a completely separate topic. So we're going to focus on clinical scenario number one. So what does that mean? These are patients with multiple tendon involvements, uh, a, a, a massive tear, retracted, chronic in nature, often with severe atrophic changes, greater than, than grade two Gautier uh, classification, oftentimes with significant functional deficits, possibly previous rotator cuff repairs, and minimal or no arthritis. Now, the spectrum of how these patients present can be quite variable, as you've heard from the previous speakers. They're not created equal. You'll have patients with different range of motion, different levels of pain. Their age will differ, whether or not they've had previous surgery, and what their expectations are with respect to the outcome of their surgery. So I like to look at the two different patient presentations. Let's look at patient A. Patient A is the patient who presents with, again, a massive rotator cuff tear, no arthritis, irreparable, one with pseudoparalysis, severe disabling pain, older, 70s, 80s, 60s, in that range, with a sedentary lifestyle. That's one presentation. The second presentation, patient B, comes with excellent range of motion, maybe even near full range of motion. They may have disabling pain, quite significant pain. They're younger. As a result, their expectations for activities is much higher than it would be from, from patient A. Patient A and patient B are much different. So with any clinical situation, you need to really understand the patient, understand the clinical findings and the results of the imaging studies, and the implant option, which in this case is really to do or not to do a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. The options are listed here, but they're limited, but I think it's worth going through them, at least for historical value. Hemiarthroplasty, the modified cuff tear arthropathy head, or a reverse. So if you do a proximal replacement for a patient in this category, it's not going to provide stability. You oftentimes still get anterior superior escape. It will not restore significant improvements in active range of motion with rare exceptions. It does not provide pain improvement, right, if they don't have significant degenerative changes, which is this category. So it's really, for these patients, hemiarthroplasty offers little, and consequently, a cuff tear arthropathy head often doesn't, uh, also doesn't offer anything because although in theory it was a nice idea, if you, if you scour the literature, you will find little, if any, evidence that this offers any advantage over a hemiosoplasty. And then there's the reverse. The reverse, in spite of what Dr. Josh Rowley has said, has become the treatment of choice for patients with massive irreparable rotator cuff tears who have failed all other treatments. And everything you heard before uh, today whether it be attempted primary repairs, tendon transfers, and superior capsular reconstructions, patches, all those things are, are important aspects of the armamentarium. However, at some point, the decision is made that they're not going to, it's no longer been successful, has not been successful. And at that point, that's when you consider a reverse. So an example is this 67-year-old uh, patient with a massive cuff tear only, no arthritis, 
a reverse was an easy decision in this person given his age and sedentary lifestyle. Now, when you look at patient A versus patient B, remember A, older, sedentary, disabling pain, pseudoparalysis, B, much more functional, the clinical outcomes can be somewhat different. There's a number of articles that have been, that have been uh, published, and I want to emphasize that these articles represent, I think, the early results of reverses in patients in this category. This uh, article by uh, Boileau and Walsh, 42 cases after failed rotator cuff surgery. Those with pseudoparalysis, uh, in other words, those with less than 90 degrees of forward elevation, excellent results. Only 7% were dissatisfied. However, those with active forward elevation much higher than that, they actually lost range of motion afterwards, and 27% were dissatisfied. The message here is, in patient B, that spectrum, you have to be very aware of the outcomes, right? And because those patients have a high, high probability or risk, let's say, of not being satisfied. In this article, as well by Frankel, similar, again, early on in the process with the Frankel prosthesis, in which he had a large complication rate, primarily because of implant design. But in this patient population, a high rate of base, base plate failure, which I think is more indicative of his initial design, which was became greatly improved as opposed to the uh, underlying diagnosis. Another, another uh, study, a longer-term follow-up by Gerber. I mean, would you recommend an operation with a 37% complication rate and a 15% failure rate? No, of course you wouldn't. But I think we've come a long way from here with this patient population. And another study by Frankel indicates that uh, risk factors for a poor outcome in this patient population were younger patients and those with better preoperative function, which, are, which is a recurring theme throughout this. Now, I will tell you that uh, before I go over my approach, uh, we're in the process of reviewing about 200 patients who underwent a reverse shoulder replacement for irreparable rotator cuff tear in the absence of arthritis from our multi-center database. And the results have been, uh, have been as successful as those who are undergo the same operation for rotator cuff arthropathy with a similar complication rate. So I think some of the early results that I showed here are no longer indicative based upon advances that have been made, not only in implant design, but also in patient selection. So for me, a reverse is the procedure of choice. It's an easy one in patient A because it's painful, limited range of motion, less active, and I can assure them with 90 degree plus certain, certainty that they're going to be very happy afterwards. Patient B is a whole different deal. That requires a much more extensive preoperative discussion focused on the outcomes and for them to have realistic expectations. And frequently, I'll send them to one of my colleagues for, for a non-prosthetic uh, disc, uh, disc treatment option, at least a discussion, so they can know full well what options they have available before proceeding to a, a, a reverse, particularly at a younger age. So there are some technical aspects when you do this procedure. For me, the, uh, it's important to preserve all intact rotator cuff tissue to the point where if the subscapularis is intact, I would consider a subscapularis sparing approach where certainly I would repair the subscap afterwards. Intraoperatively, I carefully assess the range of motion, make sure that I, don't, I do not have any uh, limitation that I've imposed because of the tension on the repair. It's important to avoid excessive tensioning, particularly in patient B, right, and to have, achieve that balance between stability and range of motion. So in 2020, reverse shoulder arthroplasty for massive rotator cuff there has an important role. It is a challenging population for the reasons I said. Patient A, you're much happier when patient A walks into your office than patient B. I think the earlier complications, revisions, and failures have been addressed, and the outcomes are more consistent. And I think as we're going to show in our series and others will show, a careful discussion preoperatively so expectations are understood is important. And the postoperative management of the activity level is important in order to achieve implant longevity. Dr. Jajmawi's concerns about the, the, uh, impl how long the implants will last in younger populations should, has to be considered because now that we're doing this operation in younger patients, you know, lasting 20 years or, or more becomes not only a, a, a expected but really mandatory. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Zuckerman. Uh, thanks for an elegant presentation. 
I have two questions for you. Uh, one is from uh, the attendees uh, asking about your RTSA precautions. So when you do RTSA for a massive rotator cuff uh, tear, uh, is there anything in particular compared to your standard routine RTSA precautions, like leaving them in a no. sling for a long time or anything? No. No, uh, if I'm happy with the stability intraoperatively, then I follow the same protocol, which, of course, everybody's protocol can vary uh, greatly. My protocol is uh, for the first two weeks they're in the sling, but even during that time, I encourage them to proceed with active range of motion in the sling, even though they're performing assisted range of motion exercises. At two weeks, they come out of the sling and they start seeing a therapist. The only thing I don't, I restrict for the first five weeks or so is arm extension, internal rotation behind the back, or moving the arm posterior to the plane of the trunk. I think that increases the risk of anterior instability, so I'd like to control that, but that's a personal preference. I've not done anything to show whether that's necessary or important. Second question, uh, RTSA after a failed SCR. Any experience with that and uh, any tips uh, with that surgery? Well, I've done a few of those, right, uh, mostly from elsewhere. Dr. Jajrawi's uh, capsular reconstructions are generally uniformly successful, right? So he has not enhanced my practice at all, at least in terms of this operation, right? So uh, in general, it's a much more, uh, it's a more difficult operation, primarily because of the scarring and the tissue, right? You, oftentimes, you have more inflammatory tissue within the subacromial space but basically, it, 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 you have to excise it, uh, the tissue, in order to basically expose it. But beyond that, I don't think it's more, uh, it's, it's more difficult as such. Of course, with any previous surgery, you have to have a low threshold to consider infection, and that goes for the SCR as well. Yeah, I, I, Mandeep, Mandeep yeah. I would add that Dr. Zuckerman's being very nice. I, I have sent him some of, uh, you know, my failures, and, you know, the, the failures – range that you could have an intact SCR graft and my feeling is more so than ever when there's even a remote amount of arthritis th those are the ones that I'm concerned about and I do agree with Dr. Zuckerman in the sense that yeah there were there there's definitely a role for the reverse and for me it's once that arthritis starts creeping in then that's when you know the SCR I think is just too much and the patients going will do far better with a reverse even if they're younger. So my, my indications are becoming more strict. If I see any arthritis on their, their MRIs, I'm, I'm starting to, to back away and sending them for reverse. Quick question, Dr. Uh, Jesravi, since you asked. What about, uh, let's say they don't have major arthritis because you know most of the time the glenohumeral joint space is actually pretty well preserved. Does proximal migration factor into your decision for doing SCR versus, uh, you know, backing off? No, it's re it's really, it it's for me, it's all based on the amount of uh, glenohumeral arthritis. My feeling is if I can get a good SCR in there and they have no arthritis, I, I can get that, control that superior migration, I can win in a case like that and have a good outcome. So th that doesn't impact me as much as, the degree of arthrosis there. Usually, if you have that much superior migration, you're usually catching them later on in the game, and they have they're already starting to develop some humeral headwear. That's good to know. So I have a hypothetical case that I'm going to be at five minutes. I think it'll be an interesting uh, exercise to go through. Uh, uh, a 45-year-old right-handed dominant male who has had past two arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. He presents to your offices uh, with pain and weakness. Uh, on examination, he's able to elevate his arm to around 120 or 130 degrees with pain throughout that arc of motion. And uh, his x-rays do not show any major degenerative changes, maybe a very small uh, proximal migration but uh, nothing major. Uh, his MR shows that he has at least a grade two to grade three fatty atrophy in infraspinatus and supraspinatus. With that information, Dr. Desravi, I'm going to ask you, would you offer this guy an SCR? And if not, what would be your strategy? We're well, going to keep it so that we can go through all the presenters. Well, well tell me the quality, the MRI. 
Tell me about uh, the car. So, 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 so he has a partial tear in his biceps. He has a grade three fatty atrophy and supra, grade two in infra. His subscap is intact. No, the cartilage, man, deep. The cartilage is okay. He's got, uh, he's got, uh, you know, no, no focal cartilage defects, no cartilage thinning. He's young, 45, manual labor. Okay. All right. Yeah, for me, that's, that's a good, you know, case for an SCR. That I would speak to him about it prior to, to a reverse. Dr. Rakito, would you would you go in for a third orthoscopic repair, or what would be your approach like? Can you give us a run through about this case in your practice? Uh, his primary complaint is pain uh, and weakness. Is he's got yeah. he's got good he's, okay. Well, he's able I mean, to go up to like one thirty, but he he's just like annoying pain. Yeah, I mean, without looking at the imaging studies based upon the description you gave, I think I probably would scope them, but I'd have the conversation that we may be doing a superior capsule reconstruction. But if there was repairable tissue there, uh, I may, I may, I may do a repair and then uh, augment it with uh, some type of uh, uh, biologic patch uh, on top of that to try and give him one more chance. He's 45; he's very young. Um, I, I don't think I would uh, do, do my best to get him to do well with his own tissues. In, in terms of setting his expectations, what, do you think uh, setting his expectations will be an important part of the discussion as well? Because, you know, most of these repairs that are going to happen at his third surgery are going to be more of aiming for pain relief. Is that correct? Appropriate to say? Yeah, of course. I think this is a patient that you're going to follow for a long period of time. Uh, uh, at some point, I think you have to repair this patient uh, for the, the fact that they're probably heading for some type of arthroplasty uh, down the line. But you want to get him. He's 45 years old. He's young. You, you, you want you want to get him another decade if you can or more. Uh, so you're going to do what you can to make him as comfortable as he can. And if it's with his own tissues, uh, all the better uh, before uh, considering an arthroplasty. Dr. Kwan, tuberoplasty or tendon transfer? If he's a manual labor, a tuberoplasty, probably would not going to be enough. Plus, he can't active elevate to 160, 170. He could only elevate to 120. So tuberoplasty is not going to give him more active elevation. Um, and because of the pain, he also would not be a great candidate, great candidate for tendon transfers. And obviously, he's too young for a reverse. So basically, in this guy, at least unless something else is up that I, I'm not recognizing, I would probably have a conversation about going in arthroscopically, doing an examination, see if I could do any repair. If I could do a, either a complete or a pretty close to complete or, you know, high degree partial repair, I would do that first. But if I, but I would go in with the idea and having the patient being informed that if the tissue is bad and it's not repairable, then at the same setting, you would get an SCR. So we'd have the SCR in the back table available to go. Dr. Dr. Zuckerman, the patient gets an SCR from outside and uh, doesn't help him with pain. His range of motion doesn't improve. Is there any indication in your practice for a guy young like this where you would offer a reverse after two failed arthroscopic repairs, failed SC repair, SCR, and he's 45? Yeah, so uh, yes, there is. Right. I think in, that once you get uh, down below a certain age, you have to make sure you exhaust all non-prosthetic options. If that's, if, if that's been unsuccessful, right, then I think there is a role for reverse. I, I have, right now, I have no, no lower age limit for people I do reverses in. Right. In this particular category, there's a lot of different options right, that you want to make sure you utilize. But if they failed all that and they've got uh, significant functional limitations and pain and such, I mean, these are not patients who are going to come in with excellent range of motion. Once they've gone through this, they're going to come in with, with significant disability. I think it's a good option, right? And I, I wouldn't hesitate to do it. All right, our time is up. I want to thank all the panel speakers, uh, organizers, and I want to thank all the attendees to be uh, who uh, are part of this uh, webinar today. And uh, I really thank everybody. Good evening.